Welcome to Oxford News This Week. I'm Elgin Nichols. And I'm Terry Stiles. A local bank is robbed and telltale signs you should watch out for in your aging parents. Learn more about these stories and others. The Oxford News begins right now. Around noon last week, a masked man entered the Oxford Bank in Dryden and with one hand in his pocket demanded the teller turn over all her money. The amount has not yet been released by bank officials and according to police, the man was white in his late 40s to early 50s, 5 foot 10, medium to stocky build. The man, who was wearing a black ski mask, blue pea coat and dark colored jeans, was seen running from the bank and drive off in a light-colored Chevy or a Buick traveling south on Rochester Road. Police are conducting a statewide search for the suspect who they believe has committed other bank robberies in Michigan. No bank employees were injured in the robbery. Spokespersons for Independent Village located in Waterstone subdivision says this time of year is difficult on many aging adults and family members should be aware of the signs indicating that they may need help. Some of the safety items to watch for are noticeable weight change, unopened mail bills or letters from creditors, driving difficulties, observe if pets and plants, plants are being cared for, bruises, bumps or other injuries caused by falling, disoriented or frequent memory loss. Learn more about how to help the elderly person in your life by contacting the staff at Independence Village or any other retirement home in our area. As part of the Oxford Public Library Fireside Chat series last week, Oxford Community Television Station Manager Bill Service and Production Manager Terry Stiles were there to inform residents about the important roles our public access television station plays in our community. For the past 30 years, OCTV Cable has been covering only local news, school sports, entertainment, special programming, and community events exclusive only to Oxford Township, Addison Township, and the villages of Oxford and Leonard, and no one else. One audience question came up, however, and it was, how is Oxford Community Cable Television financed? Which comes from franchise fees paid by you, the viewer, to your cable company, and those funds are forwarded then to OCTV by local governments to support local informational television public access. Oxford Township forwards the full 100% given by Charter or AT&T, while the other three entities keep half for use within their own general fund. Rezoning 125 Washington Street for residential housing was the topic of conversation at the last village meeting when village manager Joe Young informed the council that there were more than one reasons the planning commission denied the site plan. Chris Corey presented uh, the proposal uh, for conditional zoning. It did include a site plan, um, but the actual item for consideration this evening is the conditional zoning. It was uh, recommended for denial to the council by the Planning Commission, as noted, um, citing a number of items, uh, which really um, were specific to this, the project as opposed to just the quote issue of rezoning. Developer Chuck Schneider heatedly pointed out to council the same plan had been endorsed earlier by the village planner. So here, in a nutshell, is the position you're in. You can take, you've got a planning commission that says no, and you've got a planner who's your hired consultant who is paid to advise you and recommend to you who says yes. So are you going to go with your planning commission or the guy that you've hired to advise you? If you go with the planning commission, you may as well fire this guy and let them do all your planning. Look at all the money you'll save because you don't need this guy. Your planning commission doesn't even listen to the guy. Schneider also accused both the planning commission and council of stunting growth in the community. Let me just explain something to you. 
In the last 10 years, how many commercial building permits have you issued? Let me help you. Four in 10 years. How many residential permits have you issued in 10 years? 54 in 10 years. So are you on a real rapid growth curve? Absolutely not. And here I come. I'm trying to help you create a tax base. I'm trying to provide something that is a recognizable need in the community. And you people poo-poo it. And you poo-poo your planner. Council Member Maureen Helmuth explained the reason for the rejection by the Planning Commission. The conditional rezoning, the public hearing, they were also considered with the additional traffic back down from Crawford down to the uh, residential area, the additional noise that was going to be <coughs> created there, the foot traffic, the vehicle traffic. But when it came down to the motion, it was the motion for conditional rezoning. The motion was not well worded, I won't deny that. But there were reasons for denying the conditional rezoning at that meeting. And if you'd like, the Planning Commission can go back and restate the motion. Final score to the Valley, Council voted the plan down, three to one. Also at the Village meeting, Village Manager Joe Young asked Council to revisit selling a portion of the Village complex once belonging to the Township. In order to convert that space there now to bring it up to code it's going to i've got cost estimates it's going to take at least thirty thousand dollars to bring it up <coughs> fire safety the emergency lights the ada hardware the restrooms um, there's also a question whether the hvac units in the roof are still okay we there's not any leaking but that's a question uh, john lipchick our building official looked at the building and and he estimated probably more like 45,000, perhaps, or more. But it's a minimum of 30,000 to expend it, to bring it up to code, and then to find a tenant. In the meantime, we could be at least seeing if there's a proposal to convert it into residential and see what that might be as an option to consider. Council Member Cloutier would rather the building be sold in its entirety. I think that if we were to sell just one wing of this municipal uh, complex, we're really locking ourselves into um, a lot of limitations in the future. So with that being said, I, I couldn't support this, but I would support selling all of it. Council elected to solicit proposals for renovation, which will then be brought back to uh, the council for further consideration. A good neighbor possibly saved two children from harm and the life of their mother. When a Crestwood Street neighbor tried to drop off a pack of cigarettes to her neighbor, she was unable to wake the mother of two. Fearing a possible overdose of medications, police and EMTs were called in. Both the woman and her children were transported to the hospital. At the hospital, the woman stated she had been raped in her home, but when asked to take a rape test, she refused. The case remains open. A cashier at the Oakwood Market on Oakwood Road in Oxford reported a six and a half foot tall black man purchased food, products, and cigarettes using a credit card. According to the officers, at first the card was rejected, but when keyed in manually, the card was accepted. The employee told officers that something seemed unusual about the transaction, so she wrote down the brand, make, color, and license number of the vehicle as the man drove away. Police were called when the transaction for the sale in the amount of $446 was rejected by the credit company. Police traced the license number to a rental vehicle company where they are trying to pick up leads about the suspect. Police are continuing their investigation. Well, that was kind of a sneaky one, huh? That's an awful lot of cigarettes and food for 400 and yeah. some dollars. That might have made me a little suspicious. Yes. At a little corner market. Yeah, was the guy going to start his own cigarette company? Or Gosh, what? I don't know. I, I would have been... Poor girl. I mean, that's a hard situation to be in, especially if the credit card company approves it mm -hmm. when you key it in manually. There must be some kind of trick there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that must have been frightening for her and good thinking on her part that it just didn't seem right and she wrote the guy's license number down. Too bad it was a rental company. Mm -hmm. but A lot of these businesses, it's too bad, you know, but they're kind of open, you know, uh, for this type of crime. Yeah. Uh, like, it's fortunate that the man didn't pull out a gun or, yeah, you know, threaten right, you know, right. the individual's life. Right. That's one good thing. And I mean, if there's going to be a robbery, 
you know, let it yeah. be that way. Yeah, right. Yeah, and that bank robbery as well. You know, if the guy didn't pull out the gun at first, mm -hmm. I would have suspected he didn't have one because he kind of pointed his pocket. Mm -hmm. Would you gamble on that, though? No, I would not. And <laughs> no. it was a good move on the teller's part. That was, a, right. a, was what I was going to say. It's a good thing she didn't call his bluff. Mm -hmm. It was a really good move on her part to let him have the money. It's not worth it. Yep. But darn it, darn it, darn it, why do people think it's okay? Because we end up paying for that. You know, they're we not do. just stealing from a store. Um, They're stealing from all of us. Have you heard of me, 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 me? Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> that's mean, what it's all I about. Know. They don't I mean, care less about you, right? I know. Or, the, that's a shame. or the residents. Yeah. But, hey, did you put your shovel away yet? Your snow shovel? <laughs> no, we haven't put that away yet. Geez, every time I put it away the other day, I had to get it back out again. <laughs> but my poor husband had to use it last night on a. I don't know, the hawks are killing the birds in my yard again. And we had a pile of feathers at the stairs when I came home last night. So we were shoveling feathers last night. They were having a feast? That's no, yeah, those hawks, I'm telling you. Well, the only good thing it is that you, being as small as you are, you weren't out there when they decided to go for <laughs> right. lunch. Or my dog. <laughs> or your dog. Yeah, I was glad I was at work yesterday because I didn't have to hear it either. I've heard those hawks right. kill things and ah. I like living by the lake, but man, oh man. Well, you know, with this There's snow and ice that we have out there, you folks mm. be sure yeah. that you take extra care when yeah. you're on the road. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of animals, there's I saw a big dead coyote on Oakwood Road this morning mm -hmm. on my way in, and a couple dead deer. So, yeah, we'll plan ahead. Not that I've seen many bad drivers uh, no. in this nasty weather that we've had, but plan ahead. Yeah, instead safe. of a dead wolf, it could have been porcupine, you know? Yeah, yeah, Can you yeah. say flat tire? No. <laughs> yeah, Not a good that, thing. Would, that would be a flat tire. <laughs> That's it for Oxford News this week. Stay careful out there. If you want to learn more of these stories and others, stop by your local store and pick up a copy of the Oxford Leader newspaper. Or better yet, catch us right here at OCTV Charter Channel 191 or AT&T Channel 99. I didn't mess it up. <laughs> no, you did well. Coming up on OCTV, catch Oxford School News with John Ochins and Oxford Sports with Jamie Hughes. Also, join Dave Kenny with Auto Talk and Science in the News. I'm Terry Stiles, and this is Oxford News This Week, where we bring your news closer to home. And I'm Elgin Nichols. Remember, always be kind to your friends and neighbors, and thanks for watching. I'm John Ochens, and welcome to the Oxford Wildcats School Update. Former OHS boys varsity basketball coach Stephen Henning has also decided to resign from his middle school teaching job. He was reportedly asked to resign from the coaching job in early December or lose his contract for next season. According to the Oxford Leader, that had to do with a former assistant coach who had serious allegations against him. Supposedly, Henning was told many times not to let that assistant coach on school property. School security cameras reportedly showed otherwise. The leader says Henning has landed a job with the Rochester School District. Something new from the counseling folks over at the high school this week. Counseling forums. Counselor Sean Hopkins tells us why. Well, as a department, we wanted to look for a way that we could actually reach out to some of our parents and provide just an opportunity for them to really get to know us in the counseling department. Um, some of the time during the day, we're not able to really carve out that time to have parents just stop by. That's not an, a realistic option in a school setting. But we understand that there are quite a few questions that parents might have about the goings-on in the department and then the building as a whole. So we just wanted to create an opportunity for them to be able to come in and have just set topics that we'd be able to discuss. We asked Sean what grades this pertains to. Um, we had quite a few freshman parents. Really? That, even, which is great to see how many parents in this community are really that forward thinking that they're looking towards college already. Um, and we have even a set program for what each year in high school needs to be doing as they plan for college. So how did this all come about? Yeah, it was a new idea that a couple of the counselors um, we had that thought maybe it'd be a way to just reach out and get some of that information that we know that we aren't always able to just have available and make it readily available. That's Oxford High's counselor, Sean Hopkins. 
Our high school robotics teams got game now. That is, they received word of this year's competition game from the first organization. Junior Zach Spencer and senior Austin Purdy are on the team. Zach tells us more. Every year this year it's called F versus Stronghold and it's kind of based on like a medieval kind of theme. Um, it's a very complex game. It's probably one of the most complex games they've ever released for us. And pretty much the objective is to score boulders in the enemy's tower to weaken their tower. And then you can challenge their tower and score a lot of points. Zach talks about our Team Torque 2137. Um, it's a really cool program. FRC is really strong for high school kids. really gets them involved in engineering. It's a really good program. really prepares you for college. And I highly recommend anybody out there that's looking to do something extra in high school. Even if you don't like building robots, I mean, we do a ton of other stuff on the teams. Austin weighs in with his thoughts. Um, it's going to be a crazy season. This whole robotics program has given me many opportunities, and it's just a great experience. Regionals are starting in February in Waterford for our group. States will be in Grand Rapids in April, and World Finals will be in St. Louis this year. Danny Stublinski is our district's new communications specialist. She did a special thing a couple of weeks ago. She and some friends from the Kensington Church ran a half marathon to raise money for wells in Africa. It's called the Hope Water Project, and she tells us more. Hope Water Project. Hope Water Project provides wells for a Pocot tribe in Africa. They there are over a million people, they have no clean access or access to clean water. So they actually walk on average 3.7 miles to be able to find water. Um, their average life expectancy is only 39. They have no chance at an education. So this was really heavy on my heart to be able to do something for them. The church became involved with this four years ago. Danny used to be the secretary at Oxford Middle School. She says changing jobs took her away from the kids and she needed something to make up for it. God just put it upon my heart. It's time to lace up your running shoes because this is what I need for you to do right now. So it, it was kind of a big deal for me to, I've never run that far. So it was 13.1 miles. I've never gone that distance. So it was a big deal for me after 40 to be able to accomplish such a task. Kensington Church has put in 180 wells so far in Africa. Danny isn't stopping here. She tells us about her next run. In Detroit, there will be another half marathon that will be supporting Hope Again. Um, my goal is to raise $1,000 or more for each race that I do. Um, and every morning when I go out to pound the pavement, because I do it before work, um, that is what is in my mind, because it's certainly not the first thing that I want to do when I wake up in the morning, but all I can think of is I have the choice to go out and run. Um, I have the choice to turn my faucet on. I have the choice to go to work. I have the choice to read a book. These kids don't have that choice. A big way to go to our Danny Stablinski. That's the school update for this week. Stay tuned for sports. This is Oxford Community Television keeping it local. Oxford Orient Fish helps provide emergency aid to the people of Oxford, Ligorian, Addison, and Oakland Townships. One of the only self-served food banks in the state, Oxford Orient Fish provides once a month food supplies based on the size of the family. To donate, volunteer, or to find out more, call Oxford Orient Fish at 248-628-3933 or go to their website, OxfordOrientFish.org. Oxford Orient Fish neighbors helping neighbors and welcome back to oxford news this week it's time for oxford sports hope you're doing well wherever you are happy new year and everybody enjoying and getting settled back into the regular set of things the lady wildcats went one and one this past week on the hardwood the girls kicked off their week in the early part 33 to 26 a victory over west bloomfield oxford had a slight lead after the first quarter maintained it for three quarters Madeline Morris led the team in scoring 11 points, allowing Abby Bukowitz, Abby, if we're saying your name wrong, call the station. I'll get it right next week. With nine, Monet Evans and eight, with eight, junior center Grace Cleland contributed with five, four blocks, and six rebounds. A total of 28 rebounds were racked up between Morris, Bukowitz, and Evans. Later in the week, the girls traveled to Farmington Harrison, hoping to get a winning streak while Harrison took on an early lead 
Oxford battled back to head the second half, tolling two points, but in the end, they just couldn't finish out. The girls next will take the hardwood against Southfield Lathrop. That'll be a Friday night contest. We'll have the results on next week's broadcast. The Varsity Boys basketball team, two more losses this week, bringing them to a record of 0-5. The Wildcats started the week with, on the hardwood at 60-50 to 50 loss against West Bloomfield and then a slow start scoring just 13 points in the first half. The Wildcats rallied in the second to close the gap. Again, just not enough time to finish it out. The Wildcats scoring leader Jordan Jaden had 30 points. In the third uh, home opener, Oxford hosted Avondale where their Wildcats lost to the Yellow Jackets 84-53. to 53. Coach Brown said turnovers and offensive rebounds were the killer. While the loss marks the boys' fifth straight, Brown did note taking great attitude and work ethics to the court helped their cause. He also believes that they'll turn it around. The boys again will battle Farmington in their next contest. Hopefully we'll see a W in their column on next week's broadcast. Oxford Varsity's competitive cheer team took a place at 679 points against 16 other schools in the 7th annual Mardi Gras Mambo, sounds like fun in itself, held at the Oxford High School this past weekend. First place, Henry Ford uh, the 2 High School, they had 694. Lance Cruz North High School took in at 667. Lapeer High School had 4th place at 597. Other schools that were competing Lake Orion, North Branch, Elmont, Anchor Bay, Capac, Clio, Holly, Emily City Lake, and Fenton, Memphis Parkway. Wow, a whole list here. Christian Cabrini, where's Cabrini at? And Jefferson. Oxford head coach Nicole Curtis was pleased with the outcome. The girls' competition, again, will be at Clarkson High School. We'll at the OAA division meet. We'll keep on top of that and find out what happens with the girls' cheer team. Going out to the bowling arena, uh, both boys and girls varsity bowling teams are off to a strong start this season. The boys' record currently sits at 5-0, while the girls sit at 4-0. Both teams recently beat Clarkston in their streaks uh, to keep, them, keep their streak alive. This year's boys' team consists of five seniors, one junior, and two sophomores. The boys are hoping for a third consecutive OAA title in the league, play a third straight trip to the state finals, uh, Coach Laffner is looking for co-captains Luke DeLong and Eric Armbrister to lead the team. Returning varsity bowlers Christian and Tanner Kartner, seniors David Stasser, Carter Analock, Trey, uh, Tristan Boyce, and junior Will Fallon will round out the squad. According to Laffner, the girls narrowly missed an OAA title and will begin and begin to poise themselves, hopefully to capture it again. Talking about bowling, and this only happens once in a while, we want to make special mention. To have a perfect game in any sport, it's nearly impossible. Bowling, certain, no exception. So when varsity Wildcat bowler Mackenzie Jansen threw the final strike in the 10th frame, making her score a perfect 300. For the first time ever, the Romeo team tournament that happened on January 3rd, a date that will probably be etched in her mind for a while, she was ecstatic. It was amazing, Jansen said. I worked so hard for four years, and just to do that was awesome. Again, a 300 game. Jansen transferred to Oxford last year from, as a junior from Utica Eisenhower, said the first time she ever picked up a bowling ball was in her freshman year. From her coach, J.R. Lapner, he noted the rest of the team loves to have her around. She's just a bundle of joy, according to Coach Lapner. Again, quoting him, I'm real proud of her. 300, hey, that speaks for itself. And if you have an Oxford athlete in the, in the system, check it out. They have their own website up. Keep up with the schedules, local news, Oxford sports. Go to OxfordAthletics.org. Again, that's one word, OxfordAthletics.org. Gives you the schedules, scores, and future contests, and you'll know where your athlete's going to be. While you're on the web, we always urge you to tune into our website. Our website's right there at your fingertips, OCCTV.org. Hit the Programs tab or the YouTube tab. You can watch any one of our programs, whether it be a meeting or anything you want to see, on demand, on your computer, iPad, phone, wherever you choose to watch. Check it out. Again, OCCTV.org. Our Sunday broadcasts and Saturday broadcasts of sports happen between 1.30 and six. Check that out if you want to catch it conventionally on the television. Otherwise, again, log on our website. That's it. I hope you have a great day. Take care of yourself. Oxford Sports. 
Welcome to Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication New Scientist. In our first story, the U.S. government has told NASA to visit Europa in 2022. The latest budget set aside $175 million for a planned flyby of Jupiter's glacier moon, but it added a twist. NASA is required to land on the moon, not just fly past. Europa is a promising target in the search for extraterrestrial life thanks to its liquid water ocean. In our next story, memory recall works twice as fast as the blink of an eye. It takes just 150 milliseconds to recall something, half the time it takes to blink. Memory recall starts with a cue. A doorbell may remind you of a song, say. Information about the cue travels to the brain's hippocampus where a set of cells recognize it. These cells trigger an activity pattern that matches that of the memory. This was thought to take about half a second. Now, Simon Halsmeyer at the University of Birmingham in the UK has shown it can happen even faster. He monitored brain activity while volunteers recalled the location of an object on the screen. Later, he replayed the objects, but this time at the center of the screen and found that it took just 150 milliseconds for the memory pattern of the original location to form. And this suggests that the hippocampus was bypassed somehow. He says that brain is smarter than we think. In our last story, Catherine Clark's epilepsy had been under control for years. Then in November of 2014, she was hit by tonic-clonic seizure, the kind that spreads to the entire brain and leaves the victim convulsing on the floor. I haven't had too many of those in my life, and that one was out of the blue, Catherine says. She was worried about looking after her children, then aged two and four, if the seizures were coming back. Her husband, Ryan, an independent game developer, had an idea. Program a smartwatch to detect movement characteristic of a seizure and text him a warning. I realized it should be possible, and it took a week off to throw this thing together, Ryan says. Now the pair have created software that does just that and made it freely available online. Devices that detect seizures are not new. Researchers have tested sweat-sensing wristbands that can detect seizures via electrical currents traveling across the skin. But Ryan and Catherine's detection system has an advantage. Ryan chose to work with the $100 Pebble, one of the cheapest smartwatches on the market. This means the program called Pebble Seizure Detect is instantly available to any of the 1.5 million Pebble owners who might be living with epilepsy and with no need to buy anything else. The Pebble has an accelerometer that can detect the wearer's motion, so Ryan wrote code to spot rhythmic movements in the frequency range seen during tonic-clonic seizures. He figured out what that range was by watching YouTube videos of people having seizures and mimicking their motions while wa wearing the watch. Then he compared the results against scientific literature. If the watch detects motions that go above a certain threshold, it sends an alarm to the wearer's phone. The wearer has 15 seconds to turn the alarm off if they are not having a seizure. There definitely are false positives, Ryan says. Brushing your teeth is almost exactly the same frequency and strength as having a seizure, and it will definitely pick that up. He warns that it can also miss real seizures if the arm wearing the watch is, gets, gets trapped under the person's body, for instance. It's not foolproof, Ryan says. It shouldn't be relied on, but makes more likely a seizure will be detected. If the alarm is not canceled, the app automatically sends a text to predetermined numbers. In Catherine's case, it's Ryan and her dad. The text includes the wearer's last known GPS location so the recipient can come and help. The app also has a panic button. If the wearer feels a seizure coming on, they can press it and to warn their contacts. It's the only function that Catherine has had to use in the past year, although thankfully she hasn't had any more tonic-clonic seizures. Things are under control now, but we know that they might not always be, she says. She has shared the software with contacts at the British Columbia Children's Hospital in Vancouver, where she used to work as a counselor for people with epilepsy. Hopefully, they've had a chance to tell some of the neurology, speci neurology specialists about it, and we just want the word to get out and let people know it's available. The Clarks say the watch has given them a sense of increased security and peace of mind. Most people with epilepsy and other chronic conditions will tell you it's always a struggle to balance freedom with safety, independence with responsibility, Catherine says. Once you get over the shock that you have seizures, you do have to get down to, okay, how am I going to live with them? This has been the answer in a lot of ways for us, she says. Well, that's it for this edition of Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television, and we'll be right back.